Hello, and welcome to the audio recording of Nine Lives. This recording will be accompanied by images and photos prepared by Bloom and Publishing. My name is Robert Brancatelli, author of Nine Lives, and I will be reading an extract from that book. Nine Lives is produced by Bloom and Publishing of New York. No part of this recording may be used or reproduced in any manner without written permission from Blumen Publishing. Although based in reality, this is a work of fiction. Therefore, the events, people, and institutions portrayed here are imaginary. Such portrayals and accompanying commentary are not meant to malign, defame, or injure any person or reputation. Both the author and publisher regret any unintentional harm that may result from the recording and distribution of Nine Lives. This is for Edgar, Arthur, and Ryder. The extract taken from Nine Lives is a short story entitled Rocky the Friggin' Squirrel. So there we were, sitting in the yard of our newly rented house in Maryland, enjoying the spring warmth after a harsh winter in which the town of Wheaton had all but shut down for two weeks in the worst snowstorm in a hundred years. I find that people say things like that whenever we're involved, but nevertheless it was true that the entire Washington, D.C. area was knee-deep in snow. Where there were drifts, it was waist-deep. Many roads were closed, and even the local Safeway had shut down. So we trudged to Mama Lucia's on University Boulevard, the five of us, to warm ourselves with a hot lunch and listen to Papa Lucia play some Neapolitan ditties on his accordion. Afterward, we bought some supplies and Mama's homemade Italian bread right out of the oven. I remember stuffing the loaves down the front of our coats to keep the bread and our bodies warm. Then we marched back in single file through the snow, as if it were a scene from Dr. Shivago. Me, Heidi, Lena, Rose, and Deanna. But now, as the song goes, those lonely days were over, and we were enjoying the delicate warmth of a spring day in the Chesapeake Bay State. What could be better than that? Oh, would you look at that, Heidi said as she sat reading in the lounge chair in her broad-brimmed hat. What? That squirrel eating the bird seed. Look at his little face and paws. How cute. I looked up at the bird feeder I had just hung from a branch in the elm tree that stood near the southwest corner of the house. Sure enough, there was a gray squirrel munching away feverishly and making a mess. There was definitely nothing cute about him. Heidi had picked up the feeder at a garage sale, along with a picture frame on one of her strolls around the neighborhood. It had taken me hours to glue the loose pieces of the roof back together and insert the two glass slides that held the bird seat in place. What had taken so long was doing it in between trips to the grocery store, dropping off one of the girls at a friend's, and figuring out the right kind of bird seed to attract birds in our area, which required research. It had also taken me a while to figure out how high up to place the feeder, which branch, how far out on the branch, and which side of the feeder to face the yard. What really got me, though, was that Heidi thought it was wonderful that this squirrel was the beneficiary of all that hard work. What's the problem? she asked. No problem. Yes, there is. I can tell. It's a bird feeder, not a squirrel feeder, I said. Oh, I see. I hate it when she said that. A little obsessive, are we? Don't go social worker on me, I said which was hard for her to do, considering she was a social worker. I stuck out my tongue when she wasn't looking. I saw that. She went back to her reading and lounging while I looked up at the squirrel and sulked. 
I got mad watching him ravage through the seed with abandon, and even, yes, turning around every once in a while to snicker at me. Squirrels snicker, you know. It's a little known fact, but they do. This one had it out for me, even scattering bird seed my way as if to say, shit on you. But I was having none of it. I decided right then and there not to let a squirrel make a monkey out of me. Even it took precious time away from the 20-page research paper I had to write on the anaphora of Adai and Mari, which is a Eucharistic prayer dating back to 3rd century Mesopotamia. I figured the Chaldean church had survived this long without my invaluable insights. They could wait a little longer, just until I finished annihilating that damn rodent. Admittedly, my intentions weren't benign, but then territory is important. After all, isn't that what they are still fighting over in the Middle East? The truth is that I welcomed anything that might distract me from having to sit at my computer terminal by the window and watch spring float by like dandelion fluff. I was going to get rid of that squirrel no matter what. The fact that I started mumbling under my breath like Boris Badenoff should have been a red flag. Unfortunately, like so many other times in my life when there were more red flags than a May Day parade in Beijing, it wasn't. It all began on a Saturday, and didn't end till the following Wednesday. I won't ruin the story by telling you how it ends, but suffice it to say that by then I had only two days left to turn my paper in, or risk another heart-to-heart -heart talk with my advisor, who was, quote, concerned about my performance. If she hadn't been a Dominican nun, I would have told her not to worry about my performance. I hadn't had any complaints yet, which is a line from A Night at the Opera. Not that she would have thought it funny, but I would have, which is another problem. I've been making myself laugh all my life. I just wish other people had the same sense of humor. The nun didn't, and neither did Heidi. I once told another nun, an Ursuline, who was frustrated over how hard it was to get tickets to rent. Well, that's your problem right there, I said. What? You have to buy them. I am thinking of putting a collection of nun stories together. I will call it Nonsense. Meanwhile, Heidi thought I was too fixated on the squirrel and not enough on getting us back to California, which was her and the girl's only objective from the moment we set foot in Wheaton. I don't blame them, really. There were California girls with only a theoretical understanding of winter and little appreciation for East Coast culture customs, and language. After all, they came from a place where the sun shone all the time, and inventive types created things in the garage that revolutionized industries. The only thing in our garage was a bag of rock salt and half a can of wood lacquer left by the previous tenants. Saturday consisted of me running out to the yard and chasing the squirrel away from the feeder every ten minutes. Finally, I threw sticks, which got him running, literally hightailing it, back up the tree trunk, across the roof of the house, and into the street, where I hoped he would get flattened by a passing car or delivery truck, but no such luck. Sunday came, and except for those times when we were away from the house, church, shopping at the Wheaton Mall, more neighborhood walks, I began storing sticks and old shoes so that I would be ready in case of a sneak attack by the varmint, which apparently had gotten the idea that its mission in life was to eat as much bird seed as possible while giving me the middle claw. In fact, I wasn't sure at all whether he was doing it because he was hungry or just to piss me off. I mean, really, how much bird seed could a squirrel eat? How much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? Heidi said, smirking. Very funny, but I'm going to get that squirrel if it's the last thing I do. That's my man. I started thinking of more inventive ways of getting rid of, quote, Rocky. 
For instance, I noticed that if he saw me watching and waiting, even though I stood behind the large windows of our sun porch, he wouldn't come out. So I started hiding and sneaking up on him, sticks flying. He would scamper away, but always return. So I got the ladder and moved the feeder out farther onto the branch, since the squirrel had been jumping from the tree trunk to the feeder like some sort of Chinese acrobat. Moving the feeder away from the trunk would solve that problem, or so I thought. Rocky sized up the situation, figured out that the feeder was too far, and simply went out on the tree trunk limb and down the rope to the feeder. This was even easier for him, since it didn't involve leaping. By Sunday night, I thought I had solved this problem by lowering the feeder so that it hung a good two and a half feet from the limb, which I thought would make Rocky more vulnerable to attack. Either he would be a sitting duck, so to speak, or he would see the futility of the situation and find some other bird feeder to pillage. I was trying to be reasonable, since, of course, I am a reasonable man. Wrong again. Monday morning, after the kids had gone to school and Heidi to work, I found him sitting there munching away without a care in the world, which even at 9 a.m. enraged me so much that I took to throwing kitchen knives instead of sticks. This was now all-out war. I really wanted to kill him and pin his carcass to the wall in the living room, but I knew the girls would get upset. So I decided to stick to deterrence, that is, to prevent the rabid, infectious mammal from getting to the feeder. I knew that if I constructed something to block his way down the rope, he would be unable to get to the bird seed and eventually give up. That was the theory. But what could I use? I settled on the plastic garbage can cover only because it was handy. I lowered the feeder to put the cover in place. I cut a hole in the center of the cover, slipped the rope through, retied the rope to the feeder, and hoisted it like a flag back up the tree limb. That's when I ran into another technical problem. Balance. The plastic cover needed to be weighted in such a way that it remained perpendicular to the rope, thus preventing Rocky from climbing around it. Otherwise, he would be able to stay on the rope, bypass the cover, and get to the feeder. So I used, what else? Duct tape, to hang various fishing weights around the cover to balance it. The fishing weights had also been handy. When finished, it held its shape, but looked like a plastic flamenco hat with lead fishing tassels. Rocky must have sensed something was up, because I spent all afternoon waiting for him, but he never showed his little rat face. Have a productive day, Heidi asked when she got home that evening. Uh, yeah. You going back to work then? No, I'm still not done. So how's it going? Oh, you know, fine. That's good. Dad, can you help me with my algebra? Rose asked. Sure, just let me check something first. I snuck out to the yard, peered around the corner of the house, and saw him sitting there, perched on the feeder, fattening himself on the bird seed that Heidi bought with the money she earned from talking to crazy people at Providence Hospital. I yelled, threw whatever I could get my hands on, and shook my fist like a wild man. If I could have, I would have squeezed him into a compact ball of bone, blood, and fur with my bare fingers. Then maybe Heidi would be talking to me at Providence Hospital, in addition to her other patients. It didn't matter. Was it my imagination, or was he taking longer and longer to run away? I swear his rump was even bigger. Then I looked back and saw Heidi, Lena, Rose, and Deanna staring at me from the sun porch. I didn't say anything and went back inside. One of the things that you take away from reading Caesar's commentaries on the Gallic War is that an overwhelming force, while a significant factor in battle, may not be the deciding factor. As impressive as a large army might be, 
What win wars are cunning and ingenuity. Caesar defeated a quarter million tribesmen on the field at Elysia in Gaul, with only 40,000 legionaries, through deceptive strategy. Of course, planting a minefield didn't hurt. Neither did 400 cyborg-like German cavalry who enjoyed cutting down their neighbors even more than they hated the Romans. The Gauls didn't have that cool Roman sobrietas running through their veins like ice water. They also didn't have engineering, which is what enabled the Romans to conquer everything from Scotland to the Caspian Sea and the Straits of Gibraltar to Luxor. The Romans built seas machines, erected towers, excavated mines, redirected streams, built bridges, tore those same bridges down when they were done with them, set elaborate traps, fired blazing rockets with catapults, and generally out-badassed the badasses. This one insight gave me a distinct advantage over Rocky, besides my numerical superiority, which consisted of my height, not the number of ground troops. I was also pretty sure that the squirrel had not read the commentaries, and so, smug as a bug in a rug, I went to work to fix the rascal for good. And I mean good. Rescuesquat in pace, O Rocky. So, you've got a squirrel problem? The guy at the local hardware store asked the next morning as I showed up bright and early after Heidi and the girls had left the house. That's right. What's going on? It's eating our bird seed. Just one? I nodded. Why don't you shoot the thing and be done with it? My cousin Elmer shoots them all the time with his twenty-two and then eats them. You have a cousin, Elmer? Yep. He eats squirrels? Cooks them first. I see. You could try that. You sell guns here? No, you've got to go to a gun shop for that. I actually hadn't thought about shooting Rocky. I liked the idea, but it seemed a little extreme. I decided to do it only as a last resort. I'll hold off on that for the time being, I said. Suit yourself. So, let me have a quart of power steering fluid, a can of Drano, a pair of snow chains, and a flare, please. I was starting to sound like Bill Murray. Oddly enough, as the guy rang it all up, I didn't consider any of that extreme. Yes, this was total war, and I would look pretty silly if I went around with a flamethrower or even a twenty-two rifle to kill the thing. Not that I hadn't fantasized about it, including taking target practice on old soda cans in the woods near our house. But why drop the equivalent of an H-bomb when I could just as easily do the job with Drano? I would conduct total war in the most efficient manner possible expending as little energy as possible. That's what the Romans did. I had already wasted three full days on Rocky and had accomplished nothing. I had done nothing on my paper except stack books by the computer in a nice little pile, which somehow made me feel better. All I needed to get back to work on that third century Eucharistic prayer was the fluffy pelt of a major pain in the ass. I'd go to confession afterward. I rushed back home and went to work. I took the feeder down and spread wood glue over the top, sprinkling it with a generous dose of Drano. Then I ran the portion of the rope above the garbage can cover through the snow chain so that the chains formed a loose net that I figured would either trap the squirrel or prevent him from landing on the cover below. I poured power steering fluid on the snow chains, rope, and cover. Then I hoisted everything back up on the tree, tied it off, and stood back. 
There was the bird feeder with Drano glued to the roof, the rope glistening with red power steering fluid, the garbage can cover with fishing weights dangling from its lip, and the snow chains looking like a crab net. I stepped back farther to see if any of it made sense. I wasn't sure, but it certainly was a contraption Rube Goldberg would have been proud of. I just hoped it worked. If it didn't, I still had the flare, which I would use like a flamethrower. Combined with the power steering fluid, it was sure to do the job. You have to have a plan B. I waited. I waited all day. I waited all day, but nothing happened except for me getting antsy. No squirrel, no birds, no writing about a die in Mari, not even the man walking his nearly blind German shepherd every day at the same time, 1 p.m., on the path beside our house in Alberti Drive that led to Glenhaven Elementary School just beyond our yard. In a word, nothing. Rocky was toying with me. I didn't know what to do with myself. If he didn't show up soon, I would be left to face the absurd reality that I had now wasted four days on a squirrel. I would have to go back to the paper, back to work, back to being a level-headed dad with duties and responsibilities and an adult life to lead. Where was that squirrel? What did you say, Heidi asked? She had come home early. The girls' practice was over, and we decided to eat a light dinner on the sun porch overlooking the yard. Nothing. I didn't say anything. Oh, I thought you did. Dad, are you all right? Lena asked. Couldn't be better. Why? You're acting a little... strange. I looked at her. Lena, a fire plug of a girl with a dynamo personality, that attracted everyone to her, had been through everything with us. I'm not sure how she did it, but at five feet two inches, she even managed to get on the Albert Einstein High School volleyball team. No, really, I'm fine. I just have a lot on my mind, that's all. Your old dad's just fine. So how was Squirrel today? Squirrel? School. School. Lena looked at her mom, who looked at Rose, who looked at Deanna, who looked at me with those brown eyes. Then they all turned to the window closest to the elm tree. There it was in all its glory, my toxin-laced, garbage-can-covered, red-glistening bird feeder with the squirrel munching away at the bird seed as if nothing had happened. It didn't have a care in the world. It was like watching the Titanic go down. Dad, what is that? Rose asked. What is what? That, she said, pointing. Oh, it's just the bird feeder. What did you do to it? I made some adjustments for Rocky. Rocky, Heidi said. You named it? Yeah, you know. Rocky, the friggin' squirrel nearly crying. I dug into my potato salad and took a long gulp of white Zinfandel. Then, as I put the glass down, something happened. I don't know what it was. Maybe the crying, maybe the Zinfandel. But I, I snapped. I grabbed my steak knife and walked quietly out to the yard. This time I caught the SOB off guard. He scrambled up the rope, slipped trying to climb through the power steering fluid and made a tactical mistake by jumping to the tree trunk. I thought I had him and chased him around the trunk. That's when something else happened, something utterly amazing. It seems that the escape route over the roof and into the front yard was just a subterfuge, a ruse, because after the dust settled, Rocky would double back to the yard next door where he had a burrow or nest with his mate. 
How do I know this? Because just then the mate came scurrying out from the neighbor's yard and started chittering, chattering, sputtering, woodchuck chucking at me. He came within ten feet and stopped, making all kinds of noises and twirling like a dervish. I decided that a bird in the hand was worth two in the bush and went after it. But it dodged my knife and scampered away to its burrow, giving Rocky a chance to escape up the tree and across the roof to safety. Did you see that? I yelled up at the sump porch, where the four of them were crammed at the screen watching me. Oh, we saw it all right, Heidi said. That one acted like a decoy so Rocky could escape. Uh-huh. They were working together. Right. I looked back and forth from the sun ports to the feeder and finally went inside. Hemingway was wrong, after all. A man can be destroyed as well as defeated. I felt like the old man in The Old Man in the Sea. You know, I've been thinking about buying a twenty-two rifle, I said some time later. I think you girls would love it. We could take target practice in the woods. What do you say to that? We love you, Dad, they said. If you like this, you can buy the entire book, Nine Lives, or some of my other material at Amazon.com, or RobAmazon.com, or you can go on the Internet and search for the Brancatelli blog. Thanks very much.